Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel, Daniel Rosalier. If it's, a, if it's your first time, welcome to the channel. If it's not your first time, welcome back. Uh, if it's not your first time, you will notice that I have mixed up the production. Instead of you looking at my uh, bookshelf on my books, uh, you're looking at my delightful face on a white background. I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, my friend actually did recently say I need to up the production value on my vlog. So I've actually gone ahead and done exactly the opposite. Um, I am using this time a... A reporter's microphone I know it looks a little bit ridiculous and using something like a lav mic is much more common but I personally really like this microphone so I'm going to use it for this vlog anyway you didn't come here to hear about uh, microphone stuff if you clicked on this title so let me get into it what I want to talk about in this uh, video blog is why I uh, personally do not support Hasbara or really Israel advocacy I would almost say now this is definitely a minority opinion and I guess it's actually partially for that reason I'm putting it on YouTube because um, everyone has a couple of things that they see differently from the consensus. Um, I don't have that many, but this is definitely one of them. And what I mean by that really is that I would consider myself broadly in the pro-Israel camp. Um, I did move here from Ireland um, to live in Israel, and that already is enough for probably 95% of the world to say that guy's pro-Israel, right? If you move to live here... Uh, from the Jewish diaspora or from anywhere for that matter you kind of endorse to a certain extent uh, Israel now I've talked about before that my decision to make Aliyah uh, to move to Israel was because I think that um, it's the place to be for uh, Jews I think is the most amazing thing to happen in modern Jewish history but I've tried to articulate this belief of mine that I don't necessarily think and I think it's a pity that it's perceived this way that by making Aliyah you sort of become that Hasbara has become sort of such an ingrained part of the Jewish identity that it's almost like it's 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 so normative now that if you do if you're Jewish and especially if you make Aliyah you must be into Hasbara you must be uh, you know sort of an unquestioning advocate for Israel and uh, I find those that sort of chain really strange um, my politics I mean so what do I think about Israel just to sort of clear this out before I go further. Um, I'm probably on the left of the Israeli political spectrum, or at least as it's defined now, as it's defined nowadays, which has shifted to the right in uh, in recent years. Uh, I'm personally uh, support the two state solution. Um, think that what Israel is doing currently in the West Bank is not sustainable, justifiable, moral, uh, etc. Um, and that's really my hope, and it's not really sort of even really a, I'd say, benign hope for the Palestinians that they have their own state. I just need, I, I think that we and they need the best and most hermetic separation uh, possible, and that that's best achieved in the form of some kind of statehood for the Palestinians, and anything that undermines that on Israel's part is deconstructive. Of course, the Palestinian, the terrorism we're seeing at the moment is completely, uh, completely unacceptable, etc. I'm not a spokesperson for Israel, I'm not a spokesperson for the UN, I'm just a guy with an opinion speaking into a microphone. So anyway, that's my take on the on the conflict, basically. Why I don't like Hasbara, though? So um, this is sort of the, the dissonance that I would say I see in that um, I, f I think that most people who define themselves as pro-Israel um, don't feel this way. So again, that's why I'm sort of putting this out there. I did a video blog about this, by the way, a year ago, and I got tired of all the comments, both from the pro-Israel and pro-Palestine side, actually, which is sort of ironic and how I feel about this conflict. After living in Israel for seven years, the more I live here, the less, uh, the more tired I'm getting of seeing black and white narratives, of seeing extremism uh, from both camps. So I think just seeing all these Long live Israel and then free Palestine uh, comments back to back just got a bit exhausting. For what it's worth, my comments policy going forward, I I think I've matured a little bit since then. I just let people have their space to vent and, uh, you know, just put out what they want about their side of the conflict. But uh, when it gets to ad, ad hominem attacks, I think that's how it's pronounced, ad hominem, ad hominem, ad hominem, uh, attacks on the, the person anyway, whether that's me or other commenters, that's where I think the line should be drawn. I think that's YouTube's common policy anyway, but that will be what I, the one that I sort of uh, try to uh, enforce on this channel. Now, regarding Hasbara, so firstly, I actually did Hasbara back in the day. Um, there is a pro-Israel organization in Ireland called the Irish-Israel Alliance, but before that, 
uh, was founded, and I've no never had any involvement with that organization, there was one called Irish for Israel. Now, I actually technically, very technically, started Irish for Israel. I bought the domain, built their first website, and then left the project pretty early on and handed it over to a guy called uh, Barry Williams, who really did all the work for it. So I'm not trying to take credit. Um, I'm just saying that back in the day, and we're really talking here back in like, you know, uh, when I was in college, gosh, 2008, so a really long time ago, um, I put up the first iteration of that website, you know, did the usual Hasbara stuff, I went on a few radio interviews, um, I had a sort of relationship with the Irish embassy, the, sorry, the Israeli embassy in Ireland, they sent me on a couple of events, uh, and that was it, basically, that was my involvement in Hasbara, but I did enough of it that I, you know, wrote the fact sheets about Israel's separation wall isn't really a wall and it's actually mostly fence, all that kind of stuff. And um, so I've kind of seen a little bit of that world, rubbed shoulders with people in the world of Hasbara. Why I've sort of come to believe after living here in Israel that it's not helpful, that's another story. And that's the one I want to sort of talk about here. Um, I have a list of grievances. I actually have uh, a, a printout for this vlog and I'm going to just try hit on some of these points. So immediate impetus actually it was these emily schrader yosef Haddad, these two guys recently who are sort of what what i would put down as classic hasbara people went on a trip to ireland and my uncle um sent me a link to one of their radio interviews and said oh what do you think about this and i said well really honestly hasbara is not my scene at all and he was surprised by that and my i was like oh this is this should be an interview this should be a video i was actually going to do an animation so i'm doing this instead um let me just sort of outline my my grievances uh here so i think the main problem i see with hasbara is that it is basically propaganda now people who engage in hasbara and it's a very very big community and it's a uh it's a heterogeneous community as well so you have you know israel the official hasbara that the state of israel publicize publicizes through uh its ministry of Strate Strate strategic affairs and that's another thing that I have personally an issue with. I, I don't think that the Israeli taxpayer should be funding Hasbara. I think it should be absolutely funding Israeli professional diplomacy. And I think that the uh, work of uh, Bibi, during the Bibi government, uh, to undermine the work of the diplomatic corps was very harmful to Israel's interest. Nevertheless, I don't think that we, the Israeli taxpayers, should be picking up the tab for this kind of more propaganda type messaging and that's where i see the line being being drawn so people who do hasbara will tell you you know hasbara literally means it comes from the word in hebrew the verb in hebrew le hasbir le hasbir means to explain and hasbara is the noun that comes out of that verb and it means sort of an explanation so uh it's used in you know in a uh, day-to-day modern hebrew people will say well that's a uh, hasbara shall mashu to mean that's a sort of an explanation an outline of the topic so, but that to me is a semantic point because the way that Hasbara is done really doesn't give an explanation. An explanation to me implies some degree of objectivity or neutrality. And the lens through which Hasbara is done is almost always uh, extremely one-sided and pro-Israel. It's not objective. It doesn't even pretend to be objective. So when people in the Hasbara world will tell you, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, Hasbara is not propaganda. It actually means, comes from Le Hasbir in Hebrew, which is why I explained that. My reaction is, well, yeah, that's that's lovely and that's correct. You can open a dictionary and, and, and see that fact, but uh, what you're doing is not an objective explanation. Um, and that's kind of the first point that I'm trying to articulate here, that any narrative about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the broader Israel-Arab conflict that just presents one side as the endless hero or the endless villain is in my experience living here and observing this conflict not accurate and that's where and by the way when i attack hasbara or what i'm trying to do in this in this video blog um i think that the opposite of hasbara uh palestine solidarity campaigns are often as bad if not worse so i'm just engaged more with hasbara because i'm jewish so i'm on this side of the of the fence if you will and this is what i see all around me and i feel like it's my uh, issue to discuss about whereas Palestine advocacy is really something that you know and so other people do basically but um, I think they're both one is as bad as the other um, and I think that you know when you're looking at a conflict as complicated as this 
there is going to be things that Israel does that are wrong and Israel things things Israel does that are right. And the problem I see with Hasbara as it's commonly practiced is that it always feels to me as the people who become Hasbarists, and that's a word that we're seeing catching on on the Twitter sphere. Um, I believe it was a uh, journalist who wrote an article for Tablet magazine on the curse of Bibiism. Yaakov Hirsch, I believe, is his name. I think he coined the term Hasbarist. There's no, there's no real good word for it in English, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that term. Um, but the way that uh, Hasbara seem to operate is that they, it's like they've taken an oath that they will defend everything Israel does. And they will, they will say occasionally, well, you know, Israel is not perfect and no country is perfect. And there are these kind of token concessions, but they're really just token concessions. They're ultimately going to argue that Israel's right, whether it's regarding the proportionality of response to rocket fire in Gaza or whether it's in response to uh, the construction of the security wall. And that almost becomes uninteresting from the perspective of a debate. Likewise, the Palestinian side in this uh, will say the same thing. So that to me already is a reason that as someone my first love if you will was journalism i was originally planning to go into journalism then i got sort of segued into corporate communications but as some as that's my mindset is i'm interested in discovering the truth i'm interested in debate and anyone that signs up for a worldview that says either israel's always right or israel's always wrong or flip that around the palestinians are always right the palestinians are always wrong is not someone i'm really interested in listening to or engaging with or debating because I don't think that they're, uh, it, it, it's, it's not a rational actor. It's not a rational person to discuss with. So um, that's the first reason that I think, and I think this is another point that I've always felt that Hasbara was kind of at odds with the Jewish tradition of debate. Now, if you open the Talmud, uh, which is the oral Torah that accompanies the written Torah, you'll see it's full of endless debates. And there's very much an op- a culture of openness um, in Judaism around questioning the prevailing uh, you know, worldviews and challenging and that. And that's why the Hasbara echo chamber really almost feels a little bit cultish to me because it's kind of like we've shut down or we've closed the door on that whole tradition and said that we're we're going to replace that with Zionism almost as an ideology that supersedes Judaism, as, you know, something that this is our whole identity is based around defending Israel. And I think that a lot of Jews in the diaspora whose Jewish identity is perhaps not so strong, buy into the Hasbara world to an extent that far exceeds what your average Israeli feels about. If you ask your average Israeli and you take them out for falafel or gold star, gold star, which is our local beer here, I think you'd find a lot of people are pretty moderate and say, yeah, Israel does some good, does some bad. Uh, they're definitely you know pretty nationalistic and pro-Israel, patriotic, I guess is a better word for that. But people aren't necessarily bought into this whole sort of idea that, well, everything Israel does is perfect. Because it's very difficult to live in a country and see it from one centimeter and come to see its pros and its cons and maintain that kind of a dream that everything Israel does is perfect. So it's my observation is that Hasbara tends to be more popular amongst uh, diaspora Jews and even non-Jewish pro-Israel fans. And I always really question is this doing any good whatsoever for those of us who do live in Israel and are affected by the outcomes physically of uh, of what goes on and how Israel is perceived in the world. Um, So yeah, that's my first point about Hasbara. It's not grounded in reality because no country is perfect, including Israel, in its domestic policies and its foreign policies. And the Hasbara world seems to have sort of adopted this position that everything Israel does is perfect and must be defended. And a couple of friends in that who were sort of tangentially connected to the Hasbara world would actually agree with me and say, well, that is a form of Hasbara. We're trying to do something else. So, you know, perhaps there are ways that Hasbara can be more tactfully done. Um, but I see a lot of it falling into this category. Um, the taxpayer investment, I think I mentioned, I'm actually on take three of this video. So I may mention it. If, forgive me if I'm re- repeating myself here. Um the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, I don't think that Israel uh, Israel's taxpayers should be funding. I think that Israel's taxpayers should be funding professional diplomacy. And I guess one other, you know, I talked earlier about the, the translation of Hasbara, whether you view it as meaning uh, propaganda or whether you view it as meaning uh, uh, explanation. And public diplomacy would be another synonym that comes up. And public diplomacy, I would again argue that public dip- Hasbara as large chunks of the Jewish world. I'm talking about organizations like APAC, 
um, an organization who really just, uh, their mission statement says, stand with us, um, who says, we're here to advocate for Israel. Um, and I would argue that's not even really public diplomacy. Public diplomacy is an interesting concept that, you know, in the traditional way in which diplomacy was practiced between statesmen and embassies and governments. And nowadays we have tools like Twitter that allow governments to talk directly to people. I think that's very commendable and very important. But does that necessarily mean that that communication has to be in the form of uh, sort of propagandistic messaging? And that's that. I would, I would, I would question that basically. So uh, people will probably argue that Hasbara has public diplomacy. Therefore, the Israeli taxpayer should be funding the professional diplomatic corps, whose work again has was shamefully underfunded during the BB era, um, and therefore it should also be funding public diplomacy. But I think that that argument uh, really hinges on whether you think Hasbara equates with public diplomacy, and I would argue that that's not necessarily the case. Um, here's a bigger point about Hasbara that bugs me. This comes back to, um, this is why I mentioned these two, Emily Schrader and Yosef Haddad. Yosef Haddad is a uh, Christian Arab from Nazareth. And I happen to be involved in a Palestinian-Israeli dialogue group, a coexistence group. We meet uh, every couple of months and hang out and have a couple of beers and just get to, to know one another. And these guys really hate Yosef Haddad. And I guess... Their arguments are pretty much why I don't like it when Israel wheels out these, uh, these you know, um, Israeli Arabs who love Israel and say everything Israel does, does is wrong. I'm not saying that th these people don't exist. I'm just, qu what I find distasteful about the whole thing is that it's very, very selective. It's kind of tokenism. And, you know, Israel will be the first person to argue that uh, you can't judge Israel by the actions of all its people, especially when those are people on the right wing, and you can't generalize. And then it does the it does exactly that. It cherry picks um, a few very integrated Israeli Arabs who've sort of, and it almost feels it almost feels like they're the good Arabs, you know, like these guys are palatable, and we're gonna rush to do photo ops with them. But the story that isn't told is the fact that there is significant discrimination against. Israeli Arabs and significant underfunding in Israeli Arab communities and they have their own set of issues as well uh, especially uh, violence recently so I've put down in my, in my notes for this vlog or whatever you want to call it that isn't this kind of just tokenism basically when we have when we take the good Arab or the good Bedouin and we bring them out on speaking tours and kind of float them around the world and I guess what my Palestinian coexistence group what they take issue with as well okay, this guy is, uh, this guy feels that way, but this is not necessarily the predominant belief amongst Israeli Arabs. My experience, and I I, I don't really have that much experience, is, is the truth. I don't know if there's polls about this. I think there are. I, th I, I, you know, I hear Arabs in their own discourse talk about Arabs of 48 and Arabs of 67. Arab uh, Tamani Arba'in, Arab uh, Sabah Sitin. In other words, that there's Palestinians in the West Bank and Palestinians in Israel. So that's always been my understanding of the normative um, worldview, but then again, I hate when people talk for other groups, so as I'm not an Israeli Arab, I'll just leave it at that. Um, that's what I believe or have heard is their, is their internal worldview. So uh, there are, of course, Muslims who voluntarily enlist in the IDF, but the um, attention that they get in, in, uh, in the world of Hasbara creates this false picture of a perfectly integrated Israel. It's, almost, it's, it's really Disneyland stuff. It's kind of you know, I've been living in Jerusalem for seven years. How much integration do I see between Jews and Arabs? Honestly, very little. Um, do you Are there Jewish and Arab friends? Yeah, you'll find some in the city. You'll find, if you search for it long enough, there's Jews and Arabs who work together, but meaningful Jews and Arabs sitting down with one another, having coffee, you know, uh, women in hijabs, outside of the kind of small echo chambers of coexistence groups, which I'm admittedly involved in, I don't really see that. There's separate hospital networks, separate bus networks, separate languages, separate nationalistic identities. I don't see much integration. And again, the world of Hasbara will cherry pick a few isolated groups, people or facts to create this narrative of um, Israel that I don't think exists. It's kind of, to me, Israel is really a, a Jewish state, conservative, Middle Eastern, religious Jewish state. And it kind of wants to, through Hasbara, create this narrative that it's a perfect bastion of uh, equality, of LGBT rights, etc. And again, it's not that any of these things don't exist. 
uh, you, there is a LGBT parade in Tel Aviv. No one's denying that fact. Um, but it, it, it takes small pockets of the population or minority views and uh, tries to really blow them up to kind of... I guess it's. It, I guess it's. Uh, it's uh, the strategy here is that it's going to win Israel as many friends as possible. But if we hit all those bases, let's talk about LGBT. Let's talk about uh, minority integration. Let's talk about Israel's tech prowess. So um, Israel is is. I, I I find it all a bit dishonest. Finally, a lot of shit. Excuse my language, but you know Israel receives a lot of crap in the international community. A lot of the criticism on Israel, in my view, is justified, or some of it is at least. And then there's a lot that just people flat out hate Israel or they don't like Jews. And, you know, it's very far from the case that all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Absolutely not. But some of it is. And, you know, I've been monitoring the Irish conversation around Israel for many, many years. And when Israel gets discussed on in Ireland and it gets... Now... You don't want to extrapolate too far, I believe, always from the internet discourse to real world discourse. Because a certain type of person that gets on Twitter or gets on the journal.ie and starts posting about Israel, that's not necessarily representative of the everyday man. That's someone who feels very wound up about it and is drawn to posting on the internet. Um, nevertheless, when I do see those discourses about Israel in, I in Ireland, uh, I, I see tons of anti-Semitism, flat-out anti-Semitism, so about Israel being worse than the Nazis, Jews controlling the world. I, I see kind of crazy stuff just written there in black and white lettering. So I'm very much aware of the fact that there is a lot of the anti-Israel movement is tinged with anti-Semitism. I think anyone who uh, disagrees is uh, has their eyes closed, basically. So the whole premise of Hasbara rests on this very... Jewish logic in a sense that, well, we can argue with people. We can argue our way to success. We can change minds. And I think the problem is here that when you're dealing with irrational hatred, no amount of rational argument is going to change the minds of those people. A couple of sort of tangential points here. Firstly, people don't like when people try to change their minds, whatever whatever it is if, when someone tries to shove some worldview or ideology down your throat that generally turns people away rather than draws them closer. So I think that the more Israel screams, kicks and screams that it's the good guy and the Arabs are the bad guy, it's just kind of off-putting. And there's another point here that I think that it's very hard to say you're the good guy and the other guy is the bad guy, endlessly, 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 without two things happening. Firstly, you come across as kind of self-righteous and smug, and I think that turns people off, frankly. I think Israel's endless uh, narrative, you know, it just it just spent so much time talking about how backward the, the Arabs are and how advanced Israel is, and even if it's a large and largely or at least certain elements of that argument are true, that Israel is more technologically advanced than its neighboring countries, um, I don't actually think it really wins us any friends by constantly saying this. Um, so I think that the more Israel and Hasbaris get themselves worked up, you know, telling the world that Israel is so good and the Palestinians are so bad, I'm not convinced that it actually wins us friends. In fact, I am uh, suspect it actually turns an awful lot of people away because uh, you get the impression that, well, you know, Israelis are always... One, always complaining uh, about the way they're perceived in the world. And two, always telling the world that they're perfect and the Palestinians are endlessly bad. And uh, yeah, I don't think those are very endearing qualities for third parties who probably the silent majority just sort of doesn't really feel strongly either way about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And yeah, I would turn those criticisms on their head and say the same thing about the pro-Palestinian movement. Um, that kind of black and white reasoning from either side i think probably actually does does turn people off also from the palestinian side um so i wanted to end this vlog on a constructive note because i don't want to just say here's why i think hasbara is stupid and bad and flawed for these various reasons and i've done all that at this point so i don't my thinking is i, I want to just give you my worldview about hasbara and the question i have jotted down here which is what do i think we should do instead so I think Israel is a great country. I think Israel, uh, despite my sort of misgivings about it politically in some respects, I think the best answer to Hasbara is to let Israel's success speak for itself. It's like being bullied in, in, you know, in school and to an extent Israel is being bullied at the UN and uh, on the world stage and you can either fight with the bully or 
uh you can try if the bully is not you know threatening you or physically harming you and i guess the equivalent to that on the world stage would probably be stuff like uh military you know miss some kind of military lines against israel god forbid or the bds movement which no government to the best of my knowledge is really um adopting or pushing for though that would be threatening to israel and israelis li- uh, livelihoods i think so long as those lines aren't being crossed and if those lines are being crossed maybe the best way to deal with it is just through professional diplomatic work on the on the state level and through public diplomacy um so I think that it's it's really a pity that so to such a large extent the modern Jewish identities become Israel advocacy, go to Israel and learn how to argue for Israel on foreign campuses and wage the fight on Twitter. I see it as a huge suck, time suck, and it gets people embroiled in this really really negative world of online uh, trolling against Israel and hatred. And I, firstly, I don't think that's mentally healthy. Secondly, I don't think it's it's really uh, appropriate Jewish identity or a great way to inculcate a strong Jewish identity. I think if all that time were spent instead of people seeing it as the way they are going to express their Judaism is through pro-Israel advocacy, come to Israel, make a living here, uh, make Israel, contribute to Israel by living here, making it the best country it can possibly be. And I think that's a much stronger contribution than becoming a sort of keyboard warrior for Israel in the Jewish diaspora. Um, there are problems in Israel and, you know, we have uh, poverty problems. We have uh, the cost of living is a huge problem I've talked about on this YouTube channel. Um, we have enormous challenges here in Israel besides all the security stuff. And I really feel that Israel needs everyone it can get. I think that the Jewish diaspora is such an incredible reservoir of talent that the best thing people can do to support Israel is moving here by making Aliyah. And I think that that's much more worthy. And I think that the more Israel succeeds and continues to succeed through that effort, that's the loudest answer that one can give to the unjustified hatred that Israel gets, continues to receive and will always continue to receive. Because if we know one thing about anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry is that they really persist through the economic through the ages of history so there's no reason to think this is going to change i think that we can change our approach i think that we can um if not eradicate hasbara entirely then massively massively curtail the amount of time and energy we the jewish people invest financial resources mental resources emotional resources because all of those resources are finite and i think that they can be directed to much better ends than uh than hasbara uh, demands of us and I think that for all the other reasons I outlined as well I just don't think it's constructive I don't think it really probably wins that many friends for Israel and I suspect that it pushes a lot of people away actually so uh, that's my uh, that's my vlog I think I did write an article about this years ago I'll put the link in the description um, if I can find it um, any respectful comments thoughtful comments uh, happy to engage with them thank you for watching until the next video